Hey, biology students. This is our second video in our Theory of Evolution lecture series. And the title of this video is Mechanisms of Evolution. I chose this cartoon for our opening slide because in our last video, we were talking a lot about the evolution of the giraffe and how there were some false um, ideas about how that worked. And I thought this was cute. So the little monkey's up in the tree and he says, so tell me, why did you spend all those years evolving a long neck to get at these leaves when all you really needed to do was climb the tree? Pretty cute. So in the last lecture video, we spent some time talking about two mechanisms of biological evolution. Recall, how do we define biological evolution? We define it as, a, as change that occurs in the inherited characteristics of a population over time. So that's the definition that we're using for evolution. And we learned about in the last lecture video, Charles Darwin and his famous book on the origin of species and how he developed the theory of evolution by proposing a mechanism for how populations can evolve, how we see these changes accumulate in populations. And his mechanism is called natural selection. And recall that in his book, he actually begins by helping uh, people understand that really we have been doing something very similar to natural selection in an artificial mechanism called artificial selection. And what that means is that the breeder or the human, you know, us, we're breeding animals, we're breeding plants for a purpose. We are actually selecting for a particularly uh, desirable trait. For example, we talked about breeds of dogs. So here we have four different uh, variations of dogs in terms of their coat color and appearance. And so what happens is the breeder decides, hmm, what of these, uh, of, this of these different variants of dogs, which of these do I find the most desirable that I would want to breed future dogs to have that particular trait? Well, let's say that um, as the breeder, we decide that we would like to have more dogs with uh, spots where the background of the coat color is white and then they have either brown or black spots. <clears throat> so what do you do? Well, of course you have to find a mate for this dog. So we say there's a genetic cross, right? their offspring. If this is a genetically controlled trait, if coat color and pattern of the coat is genetically controlled by the DNA, then of course their puppies should be spotted. And here we see some puppies that have black spots and some have brown spots. So maybe you would further select with, I want more brown spotted puppies. So remember we talked about there might be inbreeding. So you might have these siblings mated and then their babies maybe would have brown spots. And over many generations, we would actually evolve this population of dogs with a particular trait in mind. The second mechanism of evolution that we discussed in the last video was natural selection. So this is what Charles Darwin identified, and he identified that the environment could select for a desirable trait. There could be what he called selective pressures or selecting agents in the environment, and these could be things like predators or shortage of food or disease um, that could select for particular traits to be passed on within populations. So remember in the last video, we used the bunny simulation. I showed you where we had white bunnies and we had brown bunnies and they were pretty much equal numbers in the population until we have a selecting pressure, this being a predator in the form of a wolf or a fox. And so the wolf would be the selecting pressure. And what happens is that wolf is, is actually selecting for the coloration in the bunnies because the brown bunnies are better camouflaged compared to the white bunnies. So the wolves eat the white bunnies and we have more brown bunnies reproducing. And over time, what happens? Well, 
perhaps even that white bunny coloration pattern goes extinct and instead we see brown bunnies in the population. And we would say this population has evolved as a result of the selecting pressure of predation. So in this video, we are describing five mechanisms for biological evolution. So there's more explanations for why we see changes in the characteristics of populations over time. Artificial selection and natural selection are only two potential mechanisms for how populations can evolve. So Charles Darwin, when he, he coined this term um, natural selection, which applies in many, many scenarios in nature. However, natural selection to him didn't make sense in the context of the peacock. So in this picture, you're seeing the male peacock, which the male peacock has this brilliant uh, blue and green coloration pattern with these huge feathers, we call it the um, the train, and so it has this huge train of feathers, and the female, we actually call the female the pea hen, is sort of this drab color, sort of gray or brownish colors, and it's not the brilliant, beautiful coloration pattern of the male, the male peacock. And the peacock, Charles Darwin writes about the peacock, peacock in his writings, and he was actually pretty annoyed by the peacock because the evolution of the peacock didn't make sense in the context of natural selection. To him, this would be a huge disadvantage in terms of your survival to have this very heavy train of feathers that you would have to carry around as a male peacock. And that would, he said, would, you know, that would be advertising to predators to come in and eat me because I wouldn't be able to fly. The peacock be, you know, would be carrying all these heavy feathers. They would not only be brightly colored and stand out in the environment, but if they were chased by a predator, they probably would be likely to be eaten compared to you know, a lighter weight bird. So this confused Charles Darwin until he started to look around at nature and he noticed a pattern. And the pattern was that in nature, especially in certain, um, in certain animals compared to others, this really stands out. And what he noticed was that the males in the species tended to be more brightly colored um, than the females. And so this is really true in birds. And this helped him develop um, a, a third mechanism for how evolution can work. And he, he called this sexual selection. And what this in, implies is that the females in the species can actually choose which males they want to mate with and they often choose the males that are more brightly colored. So look around in birds in particular, and you'll see this, what we call sexual dimorphism. Is that a cool word? Sexual dimorphism. What that means is that the females and the males look really different. Where the, the males are usually brightly colored compared to the females, which are usually more camouflaged for their environment. This is also true in insect populations. So we see in these, in these uh, butterflies, we can see that on the left, we actually would be able to predict this. This would be the female because she is brown colored and, and uh, more likely to blend in, where the males are always gonna be the brighter color. And this is because the females are more attracted 
or more likely to mate with the males if they're brightly colored. A lot of times males also have some sort of characteristic song that they uh, make when they're trying to attract a mate or even little mating rituals or little mating dances that they do to attract a mate. And this is really interesting in nature because when it comes to the biology of reproduction, remember males make a lot more gametes. There's a lot more sperm that's made by the males and a lot fewer eggs that are made by females. So the females are more choosy in their mates because they have fewer, fewer eggs and they want to ensure the survival of their offspring. So here's the other interesting point about this is that when scientists in particular have, have looked at peacock populations and they look at peacock populations and they notice that the males with the longer feathers, the, the larger the train of feathers, the more likely they are to attract a female peahen and to mate. But what they find in these studies is that actually Paternity matters in terms of the survival of the offspring is that the males with the larger trains, with the bigger feathers, they actually produce healthier offspring. Isn't that interesting? The studies support that the females, by choosing the males with a particular trait, so the larger, the longer feathers, that is actually advertising biological fitness, um, health, and the possibility of your offspring inheriting that trait and surviving better than they would if the female mated with a peacock with, with smaller um, feathers. So there actually is um, a reason behind the females choosing the males with particular coloration patterns, but it becomes a very important selecting pressure that the females are going to be the selecting pressure and choosing a, a particular trait in the males that is going to ensure the success of their future offspring. Okay, let's now look at the fourth mechanism for biological evolution, and it's called genetic drift. So we've looked at three mechanisms of selection where there's a desirable trait that is selected. Now here's genetic drift. Genetic drift is not selection, okay? It is based on random events and random chance. And this is a little bit less common okay, to see than some of the other mechanisms of evolution, but it can certainly affect the inherited characteristics in, within populations and cause changes to those populations. It just does it in a different way than those three mechanisms of selection. Instead, usually acting on small populations compared to large, okay, that's where you're more likely to see a genetic drift event occur. Um, it's due to random random events. And really there's two types of genetic dr drift that we describe. And so the two types of genetic drift that we describe, we call the founder effect and the bottleneck effect. Okay, so now let's describe what those two types of genetic drift involve. Okay, so founder effect. This is defined as a small group of individuals that leave an existing population and establish a new population in a new geographical location. So they break away from an original population, a small group break away from the original population, and they are now the founders of a new population. And we see divergence in the characteristics within those two populations now from the original compared to the new population. How about an example? Let's go back to the Galapagos where Charles Darwin spent most of his time. Remember, these are a collection of islands off the coast of Ecuador in South America. 
there are a number of very unique species in the Galapagos. And this is actually true of a lot of, we see the founder effect a lot in island populations where the organisms, the plants and the animals that reside on the islands resemble the plants and the animals from the mainland, but with variations because there was this founder effect that the islands get, get colonized by small groups of plants and animals that either fly there from the mainland, swim from the mainland, or are blown by the wind from the mainland. And it's random chance who ends up being the individuals that land on these island populations and um, the genetics that they have that gives rise to new uh, groups of organisms. For example, the penguins on the Galapagos. So um, there are penguins that are called banded. They're called banded penguins that reside off the coast of South America and also in Africa as well. They're called the banded penguins. And so they reside off the coast of South America and that would be the mainland penguins. penguins. But the Galapagos actually has a unique species of Galapagos. They're called Galapagos penguins. And this, this species of penguins is actually the only penguins that can survive north of the equator. So all other penguins either reside, um, you know, other banded penguins can, can reside off the coast of South America. And likely that's where the Galapagos penguins evolved from. They evolved from a founding population of banded penguins that likely swam um, to the Galapagos and um, diverged from the population of banded penguins off the coast of South America. And in fact, they have genetically diverged. They're a genetically unique group. They're an entirely different species of banded penguins. Um, and they actually have their own adaptations to survive in warmer water. They have different mating calls and, you know, there's definitely differences that has led to a, a, a divergence in what we call speciation. And the explanation is likely the founder effect. But again, random chance. It was random which group of penguins actually migrated to the Galapagos and established a brand new population of penguins that are the only known penguins that live in the northern, um, the northern hemisphere. Here's another example of random events that we call genetic drift. It's called the bottleneck effect. This is the second type of genetic drift. Here we see a decrease that occurs in the size of a population due to a random event and usually this is a naturally occurring event, so like a flood or a tsunami or a forest fire, something along those lines. And so the imagery here of this bottle is showing us that we have this original population with all these marbles, green and orange and red marbles in the population, representing different alleles in that population. And there's some sort of bottlenecking effect where we get a sudden decrease in the size randomly randomly eliminating the red marble from the population. So what's going to happen is that only those with the green and the orange marble survive this bottlenecking event by random chance, not because of selection, not because they're better adapted in the environment. So this is not selection. This is simply random chance. Okay. By random chance, the red marble is not, is not, uh, select or, or sorry, it's not surviving um, in this population and is eliminated, right? So in future generations, we would just see the green marble and the orange marble. We would only see those particular genetic traits. And this is not due to the fitness, what we call the biological fitness of the organism. This is simply due to random chance. Okay, so an example, this is sort of an interesting one. 
So there's a collection of islands um, off the coast of Indonesia and the federal states of Micronesia. Um, and this one particular island is called Pingalap. It's hard to even read what's on that map, but this little island called Pingalap. So it's an Indonesian island. Pingalap, it's an island. And so what happened was in the 1700s, there was a typhoon, a very, very severe storm off on the, uh, in, in, around the island of Pingalap. And what happened was the population decreased to around 20 people. Can you imagine? So only 20 people. So that's what we would call a bottleneck, where suddenly there is a decrease in the population size as a result of random chance. So what happened was the people who survived the typhoon, or at least, at least one member of that population we know of, he had a rare mutation. It was a com He had complete color blindness. So color blindness can be um, variable. Some people are, can't, can't just see red or green. Um, complete color blindness, where everything you see would be in grayscale. So if you saw this macaw bird, um, you wouldn't see any color at all. It would just, you would be seeing in black and white. Okay, that is extremely rare, actually, in the population for that to occur. However, in the island of Pingalap, because somebody in this in this bottleneck event by random chance happened to have the gene for complete color blindness, and likely there was probably some inbreeding within these people because all of the current descendants, the people who currently live on the island of Pingalap, descended from from this bottleneck effect from the this small group of people that were. Um, left after the typhoon and one of those people had this complete color blindness allele and so now on the island of Pingalap about 10 percent of the population has complete color blindness where all they see is in grayscale which is again an extremely unusual mutation So it's a good example of a genetic bottleneck event which randomly reduced the number of people in the population. By random chance, somebody had this complete color blindness allele and then passed that on to future generations where we see this, again, change in the characteristics of that population. We see a biological evolution event occurring here in this population of Pingalap but it's not due to selection. Okay, so that brings us now to our fifth mechanism of biological evolution, fifth explanation for why we see changes in inherited characteristics in populations over time. So this fifth mechanism is called gene flow. And gene flow refers to migration so migration of individuals into or out of population, but very important to understand is that it results in crossbreeding or breeding between new populations. So people are my, you know, individuals, doesn't have to be people, but, you know, individual organisms are, are migrating into a new location where there is already an established group of individuals and then they breed with those individuals and they introduce their new alleles into that established population by migrating in. And then that can change what we call, we call the gene pool or this collection of alleles that exists in the population that can change the gene pool of that population. And over many generations, we can see biological evolution occur. We can see changes in the inherited characteristics of those those populations that have experienced gene flow. Most students have a trouble understanding the difference between genetic drift and gene flow. 
Those terms sound very similar. But gene flow, the way I think about it, is that gene flow is more, in a way, is more purposeful. So if you are sort of purposefully migrating into a new area, so you're flowing in or flowing out, okay, where genetic drift, you think about something drifting, like driftwood down a river, that has sort of a random sound to it, like, okay, it's just drifting and who knows where it's going kind of thing. So that's the emphasis is that genetic drift is more due to random events and that gene flow is more of a, you know, in a way is somewhat, the term at least sounds more purposeful <laughs> and has to do with, with breeding between um, populations, new populations. So a good example of that is actually to take a little page in the, in the history of humanity, if you would, with me. There's evidence of gene flow between us. We are modern humans, and you may know this, but our species name is sapiens. So we are, we are homo sapiens, and this is modern humans. But if you know anything about human history, you may know that we are not the only species of humans that has ever existed on that on this planet. There's plenty of fossil evidence that supports that. And now there's even DNA evidence. And what they can do is they can take DNA from fossils of a close cousin of us in the human family, the Homo neanderthalensis, that's their scientific name, but you may know them as the Neanderthals. Pictured here on the screen is an artist's sort of representation of what the Neanderthals might have looked like based on the fossil evidence that we have, the reconstruction of their facial features, that they have, were actually larger brained than modern humans, but shorter in stature a really broad eyebrows and that sort of thing. What we can see from this map is that there were waves of human migration hundreds of thousands of years ago. And we're seeing three different groups represented in this map. We're seeing the yellow being another species of, um, of historical humans called Homo erectus. Then we're seeing the Homo neanderthalensis, we're seeing the Neanderthals in sort of this darker yellow, and they, they migrated out of Africa. So it's understood that modern, modern humans, based on fossil evidence, originated in Africa, and we're all African, by the way, <laughs> um, in our history. And then we get these waves of migration out of Africa. And so there was an early wave of migration of the Neanderthals, in the into Europe, and the first fossils of them were actually found in the Neander Valley in Germany, which is where they get their name, the Neanderthals. Um, and then there were waves of Homo sapiens. So modern humans, Homo sapiens evolved in Africa and migrated, that's the red lines that you see, we're seeing the red lines, the migration. So up to even just about 40,000 years ago, Neanderthals and modern humans coexisted. Right now, obviously, we're the only species of humans on the planet, but that has not been always the case. Um, so we bred, interbred, with Neanderthals. And there's evidence of that. I thought you might want to take a look at what scientists are learning about that. So I want to show you a, just a very short clip I found from YouTube of some scientists that are trying to understand what what the results of this gene flow between Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens um, might indicate. Let's take a look. Over the past about 10 years or so, there's been a revolution in our ability to read DNA from ancient fossils. And this has revealed some amazing things about recent ev human evolutionary history. And one of the most striking is that humans, our ancestors, interbred 
with Neanderthals. This is about 50,000 years ago that this happened. And there's still a remnant of that interbreeding in the genomes of many modern humans living today. Really unique opportunity here at, at Vanderbilt to study this question because Vanderbilt has a database called BioView. And it's, it's a large um, database of electronic medical records from patients in the hospital that have been anonymized, so all the identifying information has been removed. We used a, a, a large database of about 28,000 people um, for which we could have genetic information. So we could look at their DNA derived from their blood samples and predict where each person had Neanderthal DNA. We found that um, Neanderthal DNA indeed does influence many traits in modern humans. And it's a diverse array of traits. So traits involved in the immune system, traits involved in our skin, but also traits, psychiatric traits and neurological traits. We found that Neanderthal variants um, influence your risk for a, a skin disease called actinic keratosis. These little scaly the lesions you get on your skin as you're um, aging and getting lots and lots of sun exposure. And it's very possible that whatever that, you know, whatever those variants were doing back then may actually have been productive. But now, in current levels of sun exposure, in current environments, it's not, not good for us. So, I mean, another... Okay, so those are the five mechanisms of biological evolution of how populations can change in their inherited characteristics over time. And I hope that was helpful.